thank you, Paul, uh, and uh, thank you, uh, thank the organizers, uh, Giovanni Bellettini and uh, Sho Kuka Tomato for and Paul, of course, for this invitation. So, um, unfortunately, you know, I'm uh, six hours uh, before you, so some of the talks are really like in the middle of the night for me. Uh, so <laughs> It is what it is. Okay, so um, what I'm going to talk about is uh, work that has been done with different people uh, at uh, different times. As you can see, started in 2019, and some of it is still in progress. So I will try to give the white right place as I move along. Uh, so uh, uh, hopefully, the, the subject is very familiar to basically all of you. So there's a lot of stuff I don't have to to spend time in introducing, but just to set up the stage, the stage here, uh, we are going to deal with a, a familiar uh, double well potential here. Uh, so think about this mixture of two fluids. So this will be the energy uh, that I will be dealing with. Um, that is the double well potential. Um, for uh, later on, especially when I do the evolution of, of these, uh, of, of, uh, of this model, um, I'm actually going to then concentrate on a W that has exactly this form. One minus is U square square, and it's not uh, that it's without loss of generality because everything we're gonna do uh, on, the dynamic, on the evolution part is one into D, second is exactly for, for this W. I'm not saying it cannot be done more generally, I'm just saying that we didn't do it. So anyone who's brave enough can take it from there and do it from a general level. Okay, so uh, omega here is going to be, in, in the first part of my talk, it's all going to be quasi static, no time. So the container is in our N with N two or more. Uh, you will be the density of the, flu of the fluid. Um, and also I should say that the, the first part could be vectorial, but the second part when I do the evolution is going to be scalar. So, so, so values in R. As usual, we fix the mass uh, so that you don't have the possibility of sitting all the time at one well or the other. You're going to have to have a mixture of the two. So N is going to be somewhere in the spin of the region, right? So we have, we have a little bit of, of one well and a little bit of the other well. Uh, and uh, to start with, let's assume that uh, the wells are say at, at A and B. Uh, and okay, we want to minimize the energy, right? So we all know that if I leave it like that, we have a tremendous amount of uniqueness because basically any kind of patristic function which looks like A on a set E and B on the complement will of course have trivially uh, energy zero provided, of course, that the measure of V is the right thing so that the average, that that mass constraint is, is, is satisfied, right? But there are tons of ways in which you can design uh, your, your omega with these inclusions uh, E so that this is satisfied. So, um, okay, that goes back to Van der Waals. What do you do? Well, okay, so maybe one criteria to select the minimizers would be to penalize the surface energy and surface energy is uh, accrued when you jump from one well to the other, right? You don't have an interface. And, and we model that with high order derivatives, right? So that, that's your gradient here. And you put a small epsilon in front because you are messing up the original model. So this should be a perturbation of original model. Okay. <clears throat> and Gertrude's conjecture was that, well, okay, if you just leave it like that, this will be of order epsilon goes to zero, you see nothing. So, but scale by epsilon, right? That's the back of the average calculation. It's trivial that you scale by epsilon and you get something of order one, which I call F epsilon. And uh, well, in Gertrude's language, he didn't call it gamma convergence, but behind his thinking was exactly the notion of gamma convergence in that uh, at, at the limit, these energies uh, have, um, say, an effective energy uh, uh, F, calligraphic F, which is going to see essentially the perimeter, so, so the area of the interface between one phase and the other. So, so in the usual uh, GMT uh, language, that's the perimeter inside omega, 
of the phase where u is equal to a, which is the same as the perimeter where the phase is u inside omega, where, where u is equal to b. You don't count the, the boundary of the container. Um, so, so, that's, so you're minimizing basically surface area with a certain um, isotropic surface energy density, which I pull out. So that's just a constant that depends on, on the bulk energy and, and it's actually explicit in this case. So they calculate it directly and that's the way it is. That's a simple um, Cauchy-Schwarz kind of argument. Okay, I don't have to explain to this audience what is gamma convergence, but that's, as I said, that's the notion that you're gonna have in mind. And we all know that there are basically two inequalities. There is the gamma limitis, and then there is finding a, 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 a recovery sequence. And I'll come back to that. And I'll come back to that because in most problems that I dealt with, uh, usually this is the big deal is to find out is to have an idea of where do you land right what is your uh, basically where, 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 what what's what's your conjecture and then once you have the conjecture it's usually built in your gamma limit if you do a blow up whatever you have automatically self formula and so finding the recovery energy uh, the recovery sequence is basically piecing together the, the, what you have in your cell form, right? So it's in there, the building, the building blocks are there. So as again, in most cases, this to me is the most um, uh, challenging uh, uh, part of, 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 this, of this method. Now, again, we all know that the shot here is that minimizes for the approximating sequence converge to a global minimizers of F. And so that is telling us by, by, by looking at the oil Lagrange equation at its level, at its level, you're going to have loss for these minimizers. And in turn, you know that they go to the other, to the minimizer of the, of the limiting energy. So you're going to have some kind of a, a weak type of PD satisfied by, by, by the limit. And I'll come back to that. Okay, so again, this was a uh, projection that if you go to minimizers of of these, which are the same as the minimizers of the, of this of this kind of energy, uh, that you can select those that actually minimize perimeter among all other possible designs that have the right the, the right measure, right the, the, the right form. Okay, so um, and and okay, and obviously you're not messing up minimizers because minimizers of these are minimizers of that and vice versa, right? So so they are the same minimizers. Okay, very good. So this goes back to Modica, Modica Mortala, Stenberg, uh, many, many people. Uh, Bushiti, for example, has done this, uh, uh, this exercise with, uh, with coupled energies that you couple the use and the gradients and, and, and Sister Baldo did it for several well. So, so, so there are lots and lots of people and, and they are in, in the dots here, but, but basically, um, the, the outcome is essentially the same in that, yes, you can prove rigorously that the F epsilons converge to perimeter times some constant. And the space where you land is going to be part of variation because you're going to have just functions which only take values A or B. And that's because for this to be bounded, Flatus lemma tells you that the limit W of U has to be zero on the So you need to be at, at the wells on the steady time. And of course, the mass is preserved because you have L1 strong continuity. Okay, so now what I want to do is, oh well, fine. So now let me assume that I'm going to have uh, some um, periodicity in this well, um, in this W well. And so I'm going to take that W0 if, uh, if, uh, if, if I'm at A and B. Um, by the way, uh, uh, I know that some of you are thinking right now, ah, uh -uh, why is that your results don't depend on position X? Okay, I'll come back to, to that later, okay? So right now, let's assume that the wells do not depend on, on, to, on this position. Um, I'm going to take it to be Q-periodic. It can be quasi-periodic, it can be, uh, okay, this, this can be mollified, but let's assume it's, Q, Q, Q for me is the unit Q. So it's the usual periodicity with respect to the unit cube, uh, in our n, which is aligned with uh, respect to the autonomic basis, right? Class autonomic basis. And that, that epsilon goes to zero. Again, when that epsilon goes to zero, some of you are going to ask me, oh, wait a second, we have three regimes here, right? 
delta epsilon faster than epsilon, delta epsilon going with epsilon, or delta epsilon going slower than epsilon. Okay, also talk about that. Uh, the, the, the prototype to have in mind here is to have something that looks like this, and depending on position. And in particular, this is important because that's the usual, uh, uh, again, in the framework that we have in mind. And, and what is important is that with respect to position X, you should not uh, impose continuity, right? It should only be measurable because you should be able to jump, say on the unit cube, you have these blobs of, of A's and these blobs of B's and you should be able to jump from one to the other in only measurable way, not continuous way. Uh, and okay, so what you want to do, you want to identify the gamma limit of, the, of F epsilon. There are uh, related works like uh, Ancini, Brades, Kadopiat, uh, but in their case, the, the, <clears throat> the fast variable, the oscillating variable is, is in this term, is in the penalization, and that changes the nature of the problem because what you're going to have here is a competition between W wanting to jump between A and B, but according to its periodicity, which is the orthonormal, uh, which is going to be the, 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 the orthonormal basis in Rn, while the, the, the interface between A and B can have a normal that has nothing to do with uh, E1 to Em, right? And then is also worked by Brades and Zepieri, and again, kind of different, um, most it's 1D, um, and, and it's with a very particular family of, um, of, uh, of block energies. Okay, so my, the regime I'm gonna talk about here is going to be where when delta goes like epsilon. In the end, I'll say a few words about the two regimes. One of them, I have nothing to say because I, I know nothing. And the other one, I have a partial result. So, uh, okay, so we did prove um, that indeed that was with Ricardo Cristofani, um, Adriana Hagati, and Cristina Popovici. We proved that indeed what you get is something that, again, it's a surface energy um, kind of term. Interesting enough, it's an isotropic. And if you look at these, usually you'll get an, iso an isotropy when in the higher order, we put in an isotropic term, like again, an F of gradu, right? So um, this is to me one of the few examples where because you have this competition between trying to go down to a surface energy, but at the same time accommodating these oscillations where you, you start with an isotropic surface energy and you end up with an, iso an isotropic surface energy. And by the way, this is not just um, uh, wishful thinking. Uh, this has been proved, and, and I'll, I'll talk about that. Okay, anyway, you get the nasotropic surface energy depending on the number to the interface, um, and you have the self form of the two obtain dates, whatever it's obvious, right? You kind of can guess, except that's exactly the same thing with, that you get when you have this variable, and then you can prove that it's exactly isotropic if you don't have that variable, right? Which is the classical, um, the classical result. So that's again, I'm just repeating myself. Problem here. Uh, I should tell you what is <clears throat> this field, the, the, this space here. Normally, that's again, we, we all are familiar with that, right? You take a cube which has two uh, faces oriented according to the normal mu, and then you'd like your fields you, well, first they have to be smooth, they have to be H1. And then you'd like them to match with uh, B and A, which is the limiting the target. On the boundary, you cannot quite do that because those are not admissible, right? They're not traces of H1 functions. You modify. So you take your limit, which is B here, A there, modify with your preferred modifier, and that's that's your family. And it can be proven that um, this does not depend on the choice of modifier. So, okay, so the source of an isotropy is that um, if the normal is oriented like so, with respect, like this would be like a normal oriented with respect to say EF, right? Then you can pave the interface with risky versions of the cell formula. Uh, and, and in each cube of these, you basically get the right energy, just add them. But if, if it's skewed, 
then that's not true. And when you add this up, you get something that it's not uniform with respect to the normal mu. So you don't get the same thing as you'd get if the normal was like that. Um, and so it does depend on the normal. And again, uh, and again, this is it's actually it's a theorem that was not proven by, by us, but I'll come back to that. But it's been proven. Okay, so the roadmap to prove a result like this, it's typical, right? First to prove compactness, that's, that's easy. Um, I mean, it's easier, right? it's been done <clears throat> in other contexts, right? So you just have to get to the right lower bound. You use some kind of a, a modic and or a trick and you get bouncing with it. <clears throat> so, okay. Then the gamma limit, if, as I said, well, um, usually that's the one that takes more work. Here, you do blow up and you get what you get and you end up with a cell phone. Okay, fine. So this, it's, it's in the recovery sequence that you have to work a little harder. And what you're gonna do is first you do the recovery, so you you, you will, we, well, we are going to use a blow up method. And first you're going to find a recovery sequence when, when you have your interface, when the normals to the interface belong to the, um, on the sphere, and they have rational um, coordinates. By the way, that's dense. And the first time I thought about it, of course it's dense. Mm, there's a theorem of linear algebra to prove this, which was not us, relatively recent, I think in the 80s, where actually you can prove this is dense. Um, and then, and, and so by density, then you go from here, you go to arbitrary normals. Okay, so as I said, the big deal here, the challenge is that on the interface, you have two competing, uh, 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 two, 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 two competing efforts. And one is you want to oscillate faster and faster, but at the same time, you also want to squeeze your interface, well, the, the, the intermediate layer to, to, to an interface, right? So two cases. One is, oh, okay, my, my interface is aligned with the principal axis where I have periodicity, but then you have this cube one. Right, there is a line. Uh, <clears throat> in this case, since W is periodic, I'm going to tile this with the right cell formula. I just put cubes after cubes aligned in the right way. And and that's and that's okay. And I okay, and then you have to do calculations. I'm not gonna do that, but basically at some point you have <clears throat> approximating fields which are oscillating with respect to this variable. Where in the in the W in, in the W you get exactly the same oscillations with respect to the same variable, and you use riemann lebesgue lemma in tandem with the two, both the approximated sequence and all the W, and you you're oscillating exactly on the same frequencies if you wish. Well, what what if you are like that? And 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 the the, the first observation is that oh you know what. Uh, actually, I'm going to have periodicity in a lot more directions than what I started with. And it can be shown that uh, actually, um, every time that I have a normal that has that lives on the sphere and it has uh, rational coordinates, and there are not that many, but they're still there. Um, then, if I take that cube, now skewed with those align with two phases with the normal. And if I make it really, really, really large, so this land is very big, then after some time I get periodicity with those huge cubes. Okay? And, and you kind of can imagine why, right? Because if the coordinates of, of mu are all rational, take the common denominator, it's a huge number, multiply everything, and now you get stuff that only has integer coefficients, right? And now you're good. Okay, so so the first thing you need you need to to convince yourself is that if I have one such normal, then I can complement that normal with n minus one normals that still live in the same space, and such that I get an orthonormal basis. So this is not your typical gram schmidt theorem that you prove in linear algebra in your first year uh, of undergraduate studies because you need to, to be there, but it can be done. 
And once you do that, then you get periodicity, you see here, you just pack, but you have to multiply by, by the huge number. And then after that, you're good. You always have producing with respect to this more, to these other directions. But there are other things also from mean algebra that are very interesting, for example, which we use. For example, if I take one of those normals, and if I, I have a rotation that maps E n into nu, then I actually can find another rotation that has the good taste that maps every normal into this space lambda, and it's not too far from the original one. That's important. Okay, so it's some kind of a stability result. Okay, properties of sigma. It's well defined, it's finite, it does not depend on choice of modifier. It's upper semi-continuous actually at the end of the day. Once you prove this a gamma limit, right? It has to be convex, right? And once it's convex, it's actually continuous. But before that, you need to prove that it's a gamma limit. So you need, but to prove by hand it's upper semi-continuous. Um, okay, and then. And then okay, so so you then you, you go back to the same tiling technique of the first case when you are aligned with the autonomous basis, but then you just take huge huge cells that uh, that are multiples of uh, of this of this one. So you you recover six for polyhedral sets, and then uh, okay, and then and then uh, then you wrap up the usual way, right? You take a arbitrary u, uh, you can approximate. The, 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 the array U is equal to the A or B by polyhedral sets, which have this, the right normals because of density, so you prove that. Um, and then you can find, and, and because of that, you can prove that these rents converge strongly in BV. But now for each one of them, you use what you know, because for each one of them, their, their phases are good polyhedrals. So you know how to approximate that them, right? Um, which is here. So for each one of them, you approximate, and then you're done because then you can use Rechetniak's, right? Because it's a person who is any diagonalized. Okay, this is usual stuff. I have seven minutes left, and that's what I want to talk, not talk about the gradient flow. Um, part of it's in progress, part of it has been accepted at um, uh, Calcvar and PD. Uh, but it's not published yet, so uh, but um, but it has been accepted already, uh, and the rest is still uh, on the way. So okay, so now uh, let's let's um, uh, evolve this by surface diffusion, right? So you get your usual by double reaction diffusion PDE, right? So so that's uh, the, 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 the okay. So so here this is what you get normally, Alan or whatever you get the one here, right? Uh, you start with a well-prepared initial condition so that uh, basically this is a nice set of finite perimeter and, and this is essentially a recovery sequence for, for, for the set E, um, natural bounded conditions on the parabolic boundary. Uh, okay, so two disclaimers. First, um, I'm going to take W to look exactly like one minus U square squared. And instead of, and before, everything I, I said before was for um, a couple, right? It was a double of X of epsilon U. Now I'm taking it exactly of this form. It's a product, oscillations. So, so this is going to try to concentrate on A and B, and this is going to oscillate. And what I'm gonna say, it's exactly for this model. So would PhD thesis do this for arbitrary doubles? Okay, we didn't do that. Um, and, and because a lot of our computations really use exactly this form, it uses the, high, uh, the hyperbolic tangents and hyperbolic sequence and, and exponentials and the a priori estimates. It's very, very, um, it's very specific to this model. I have five minutes, okay. Uh, okay, so you assume that, so I is periodic, it's not degenerate. Uh, and okay, so you have, basically you have your, uh, Alan Khan, which is the gradient flow for this. Many people have worked on the model for A equal to one. I'm not going to go through this list, but, uh, but, but with different methods, but the outcome is always the same, which is that you're going to get a model where the normal velocity of the interface uh, is somewhat proportional to mean curvature, right? Be that using uh, uh, these process solutions or 
uh, or, or genetic theory approach. We used the we used this approach. Basically, we followed uh, Konigawa and also Mugnay and Rodney, Rodney Schatz and others. Okay, so the um, uh, the homogenization dream is okay. You know that you absolutely satisfy these. You absolutely goes to you. What is the PD that you satisfies, right? Um, okay, so again, you go back to what happens to A equal to one, and you know that you have this usual hyperbolic tangent that tells you how you go, how you move across the interface. You all know how to get there. It's a repetition of energy, uh, and when you plug that this hyperbolic tangent into your cell formula, you get exactly, because you have a repetition, you get exactly the sigma that I told you, which you see does not depend on normal anymore. It's always the same. It's just a repetition of energy with a hyperbolic tangent. And now in this case, you say, well, okay, so basically I'm, I'm working with a common equation here, but I have the A. So by analogy, let me take the same thing, which is that, okay, except that it take, instead of taking hyperbolic tangent, we include your normal to the hyperplane, which is up to a factor. But that's basically what it is, x dot mu. I'm going to take um, a geodesic distance, uh, which is adapted to the to, to i. And I'm going to have to wrap up here. Uh, and uh, you can prove that, OK, so then, so, so, so then what you get now is hyperbolic tangent, but not composed with the, with the geodesic distance uh, and and you you may you may ask okay but then can I play the same game and can I get something which looks like this in the end where this is in place of that one right and the answer is no it will never be isotropic unless a is constant um, and I don't want to go through this uh, and but you can prove you can get bounds. You can you can get quantitative bounds with respect to what you would like, uh, which is this limit limit super limitative. But you can prove that this error uh, that does not tell that does prevent you from paying a limit. This error that I say lambda naught, you have a limit if, if lambda naught is zero, right? And um, and you can prove and I don't have time to do this, but you can prove uh, here that lambda naught is not zero uh, if, if you are in the rational as well. That first proof was, was done by Feldman and Peter Morph. Uh, and actually, now you can prove that it's never zero, even for a rational world. So there was a first proof and now this is a second proof, where it basically just says, no, it will never be, and you'll never have as Um you can also say something about the planar met metric problem in that if you take that geodesic distance that appears in the uh, hyperbole in the, in the cell formula and you take its uh, asymptotic limit, you can prove, and this is true even for almost periodic functions, you can prove that it kind of likes to look like a, a distance to the hyperplane times a certain factor. And the way to interpret this, and I will finish here, so it's my last slide. Uh, the way to interpret this is the following, is that um, Mategazza Minucci proved that uh, the, these functions that are these, these uh, scales, uh, scaling photos of this geometric, uh, this geodesic distance, they satisfy their viscosity solutions for this problem, while, um, while uh, this this uh, this limit here is also the viscosity solution for this geometric problem, and what he proved was that actually these viscosity solutions converge locally uniformly to this viscosity solution. Um, there are related works by Armstrong and Cardiali in 2018, Feldman and Suganidis, Feldman and so on. But as far as we know, uh, in the periodic setting, in our setting, this is the first time that this was established. Finally, open problems at my last slide. Um, well, okay, so different um, scalings. Um, when uh, epsilon goes uh, faster than delta, then is you first should have uh, basic can going to surface and then oscillations, as far as I know, totally open. Uh, 
um, related works by Damaso, Scavia, Topieri, and uh, who else? Okay, to come to mind. Filippo Canetti, uh, but not quite the same. Um, and when you have, say, homogenization first and, and, uh, and uh, community after, uh, okay, there are related results also uh, by uh, Breides and uh, Ancini, but they are not um, optimal because there's a gap. So actually, I mean, we have preprints, but we never published that. So that's it. And uh, I'm sorry, I took two more minutes. That's a good place to start. Thank you. Thank you very much, Irene. Oh, actually, thank you for remaining in the in the time. And uh, uh, so we have some time for some minutes for questions. Anybody would like to ask something or a comment? Maybe I start with something. Um, uh, have you already thought, uh, uh, thought about uh, um, like more general uh, um, surface uh, uh, regularization term depending maybe by X? And also, uh, I would also, in you, uh, there was this other approach by, um, if I remember well, uh, Ancini, uh, Brides, Cadopiat, uh, uh, in which they had that depending by a, uh, also uh, periodic, periodic, so with, uh, with the, this surface regularization term that is also depending by X divided uh, epsilon or something. So I didn't understand if this is like another, um, another modeling something different or if, and in that case, if this could be actually merged, I mean, if uh, it could, could be something different, right? Because what I'm saying here is that the original problem is that the original problem has no gradients, right? In the original problem, I give you a container with two species and okay. I mix it at finer and finer and finer level. So that's the W of X over Delta times U, right? Yes. So, so, so that is the original problem. Okay. So when you say what I want to do is to put an X over epsilon on the gradient, what you're saying is that now what I want to penalize the surface energy depending on position and fashion and with, with rapid oscillation. So that two different problems. Okay, then could they what make is, the is the penalization. Could one put together, I mean, uh, put- Oh, okay, 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 well, okay, sure, good luck, but-, but what, <laughs> Yes. I mean, so, so, okay, so, so what I have to say, well, that's a very good question, but, uh, and what I want to, to stress here is that um, this is actually the beginning of, this is, we are just scraping the top of the iceberg because even before going there, I would say, now I want, yeah. which would be probably the next question is, the wells should depend on position, right? Why not? Moving, moving right. on uh, with respect to- uh, okay. With that, right? Okay, so this is something that we are just wrapping up. Well, actually it's wrapped up, but not, not put up yet on archive because I did, I'm still, we are still reading the, the draft. Uh, uh, Ricardo Cristofori and my student uh, Likit Ganedi, um, uh, we, we, we just proved that, we just did that. So same model except now the wells depend on position. Okay. But, but you know, I mean, the sky is the limit. You could have multiple scales. You could have um, multiple wells, right? Mm -hmm. why, why only two? Why not three? Then we go to these triple junctions things. And, uh, that, or, or you could have like even different scales on, on, on the penalization of the surface and uh, right? And, and why penalize with grad U? Why not penalize with some other PDE, right? Um, why curl equal to zero? So, Please. You, you know, but, but what, I, what I want to say, and it's, I think it's an important point is that even at the level of no time, so, so I'm not talking about Alan Kahn, I'm talking about Khan Hillier. So the first part of what I say, there's a time to be done because at least for me, this was new. I, I, we didn't have the tools at the time. Um, but then even when you, you, you start looking at, at the Allen kind of at, at, the, at the gradient flow, you see what we've done is extremely uh, uh, specific. It's done for the, the, the one minus u square squared with a multiplicative 
A. So it's a nail of X of X from time, right? You asked me to do Alan Khan with, with a coupled one, and I have, I don't know, because anything, everything we've done is very precise. The, the chart of the geodesic and everything, we, 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 we work on that at hyperbolic tangent, and, and we get exact uh, uh, estimates. Okay. There is a lot to be done. So I, I don't make any claim that this is general, not at all, right? Not at all. But, but I think it's fun, and I think there's so much to be done there. Okay, thank you very much. Any other comment or question? Okay, so 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 if not, may, may I say something? So I yes. so I have the privilege of being the the last speaker. So I think this opportunity to uh, on behalf of uh, the speakers and and I, I'm talking for them. So uh, forgive me if I didn't ask your permission. But that I'd like to thank the organizers uh, again, Gianni Bellettini and uh, Paolo Piovano and Shokuk Komatov for putting together this very inspiring workshop and and. And mostly to navigate so well these uh, the challenges of this pandemic era with different dates and different formats, and it's been very I know it's been very challenging. Um, also, a word of thanks to the Erin Schrodinger International Institute for Mathematics and Physics for its virtual hospitality. Um, it's always wonderful to be there in person. Maybe in the near future we'll be able to be there in person and network and have our coffee breaks, but um, it is what it is. And so thank you also for um, uh, switching this to this format, it had to be done. Um, and so again, uh, many thanks to all of you. Thank you very much, Irene.